Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good day. I'm the coordinator of the master's program in high performance sports strength and conditioning. And before I present uh, our speakers today, I just wanted to give you a small outline of today's webinar. So first, um, we'll have uh, two speakers. Uh, one who is a former student from the master's program who kind of will give you a little bit of background of his academic um, trajectory as well as professional. And then it'll be followed by Dr. Per Ogord, who will give a small mini lecture of um, uh, what he typically teaches in our master's program, okay? And then this will be followed by a presentation by Jose Carlos, who is our representative from the UCOM Spanish Sports University. And then we will end today's webinar with a Q&A session. Um, for those who have questions for Jose Carlos or Dr. Ogord or Tor, um, you can write them here. There's an icon at the bottom of the Zoom where it says uh, questions and answers or preguntas y respuestas, depending if you have it in Spanish. So please write your questions there and I will moderate uh, those questions as we go. All right. So um, first of all, I'd like to present Tor Sigurdsson, who is from Iceland. He uh, has graduated from our master's uh, program in high performance sport. And from the class of 2016-2017. Hi, Tor. Thank you for um, coming. <laughs> How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Great. Can you tell a little bit um, about your academic background to our audience? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I started, uh, uh, this is all started with my bachelor's degree. Uh, the reason I went to my bachelor's to sports science here in Iceland was I had very much interest in, in everything regarding training, sports, uh, and coaching. Uh, I started with a personal trainer's di um, diploma here in Iceland. After that, I decided to go to the bachelor's degree, and I took it here in Iceland. In Iceland, it's only three years. And after those three years, I wanted to do something else, and I felt like the master's program here in Iceland was too new and, and wasn't that far along that I should focus on something specific because my background from sport is mainly handball. And after handball, I did powerlifting for many, many years. And, and I wanted to do something regarding strength and conditioning and, and mainly with athletes. And so I basically just went online and, and found the UCAM university and and that was my basically my first and only choice and i was accepted and i did my year there and that was it was an amazing experience great and um since then how is your professional trajectory been going what are you uh, doing now very good actually uh, well once i graduated uh, on my way home uh from because I drove to Spain from Iceland, and then I had to drive back <laughs> all, all the way. And uh, on the on, because I have to take a boat, of course, I can't drive all the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, on the boat, I sent all the major clubs here in Iceland a a sort of a, a outlining of what uh, I wanted to do, and I got hired by a, a club here in Iceland. Uh, uh, mainly to begin with, with I started with the uh, women's senior squad here at my current club, Grotta, in Iceland. And after that, I overtook the strength and conditioning also for the men's senior football squad. And over the past two years since then, I've overtaken also the senior squads for handball and all the youth, youth strength and conditioning sessions also. So now I'm head of strength and conditioning for Grotta Sports Club with with all, all the sports. Great, that sounds wonderful. And how did uh, recently the COVID-19 pandemic situation affected your athletes as well as your profession? Very badly here in Iceland. We've been opening up and closing down for the whole year. Uh, the last season, especially, the, uh, it, it affected, affected mostly the, young, the, the younger, younger participants. Uh, we were opening up and closing down and especially the under 19s they we had the lockdown here in, in that lasted uh, about uh, two three months 
and they were always left out. So that affected them the most, the 16 to 19 year olds. And the other way basically was, I think we had like four pre-seasons this, <laughs> this last year because wow. of the lockdown we, we had. So it affected me badly. And also I have a little, I have a little private gym, w- which I run on my own. And we had to close that down, I think three or four times. Mm. And um, and are things improving now in Iceland? Or are our training yeah. back? Well, it's getting back to normal. We're we're gradually getting there. It's opening up again, and and it looks like we just finished our our we just we're just at the end of our handball season, and we're beginning our football season, and and so it's basically getting back to normal as it should be. Great. And do you have any recommendations or suggestions to our future students? Well, for me, since Per Auger the year, this was my favorite lecture because he spoke about the blood flow restriction, which, which was my master's thesis. And, uh, and, but otherwise, it's an excellent program. It, it takes, you, takes you a year uh, and you have great lectures from all over the world coming with, and, and basically just enjoy the time there. I mean, you have world-class lectures in every kind of everything related to sports science and, and use it as well as you can. Uh, and never, never stop uh, question, questioning, questioning what you're doing. I mean, always progress in your profession. That's a great advice. Thank you very much, Thor, for your uh, presentation. If um, anybody has any questions for Thor, you could save them to the end of the webinar. Um, And we'll continue now to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Per Ogor, um, who is coming from the University of Southern Denmark. Um, He's a professor in biomechanics at the most... His activities are focused on adaptive changes in function. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, you disappeared for thirty seconds or so. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm not That's sure well, where. Well, let me let me begin again. Um, we have Dr. Paragard, the from, who's a professor in the biomechanics at the Muscle Physiology and Biomechanics Research Unit in the Department of Sports Science and Clinical Biomechanics, um, which is part of the Faculty of Health Science at the University of Southern Denmark. His research is focused primarily on adaptive changes in neuromuscular function and muscle morpho- morphology or in architecture induced by training at, at the young and old age, um, neuromuscular and biomechanical aspects of ACL injury, exercise-based rehabilitation and prevention of tendinopathy and muscle overuse injury, as well as the effects of resistance training on musculoskeletal health. He has over 280 research articles and book chapters that have been published in, as well as textbooks, and which have received over 30,000 citations. So here he is today as a teaching, uh, a member of our teaching faculty from the master's program in high performance sport and strength and conditioning. And he's gonna talk a little bit about strength and conditioning, gains in strength, power, rate of force development, neuromuscular function, muscle size, and athletic performance with resistance training. So this is a topic that he covers in his master's class, but obviously more in depth, but today you'll get a little bit of a taste of of what he has to offer. Dr. Per Ogard, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Linda, for this nice presentation. And it's great to be sort of back at UCAM, not 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 in Murcia. I'm living in Copenhagen right now, and I guess many of our participants uh, this afternoon is also scattered around the world. Um, maybe mostly Spain, but I'm pretty sure around the world, like myself. Um, so maybe if I could do a sharing on the screen, I have here. Okay. So this, I hope this is visible for. Everyone? Yes. Okay. Um, so basically the, the title of my talk here is, uh, is, is, is covering what normally would take me two days um, uh, at, 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 uh, at, um, at, you know, during the real teaching at the UCAM and at the, um, at the master in high performance sports. So it's kind of a very condensed program squeezed into 21 minutes of uh, highly, 
highly concentrated information. So if you have a few questions by the end, please go ahead. I would expect you to. Um, uh, as we all know, uh, Elisa, I think that you are aware of this fact that when we are performing uh, resistance training or strength training, we're not only exercising uh, muscles, we are also um, doing conditioning on tendons and even more so on the brain and the spinal cord, that would be the, the nervous system. So we are improving neuromuscular function uh, at the same time as we are improving, say, muscle size and also making changes in structure that, that are beneficial in terms of increasing strength, power, and rate of force development. Um, of course, all of this training is done, uh, at least when we talk about the athletes, in order to improve performance. So kick a ball uh, with, a very short, um, with a very short reaction time, throw a ball and, and throw over a few opponents at the same time, and having very, very short muscle action times, like uh, the contact time of a triple jump or a sprinter running down, down the pitch, or even a soccer player doing a maximum sprint or acceleration. So it is also quite well known, and we go through this in details during, uh, during the master course, and I have you know, more time to go into depth of all these points here. But the result of resistance training is to increase force and power, not only during the kind of slow speeds where we are doing the heavy types of lifting that is most effective, uh, but also if we go to more unloaded movements and even totally unloaded movements, we, we can reach higher power, higher forces and faster speeds. Um, one explanation for that is uh, the increase in, in explosive strength, which I, will talk, which I will talk about today, the increase in in rate of force development. But another notable feature uh, in response to strength training is that we have this marked increase in maximum eccentric muscle strength, which is also highly beneficial to athletes who are decelerating or jumping, landing from jumps or side cutting, or doing very forceful and rapid stretch shortening muscle actions. Even elderly uh, going down the stairs by increasing muscle strength due to uh, visiting Tors gym in Iceland and staying there for three months to do the heavy resistance strength training. Well, the improvement is and strength will decrease uh, the risk of falling going down down a, a flight of stairs. So, you know, the experience that we have in the training of athletes is highly beneficial for many other individuals in, in our society. As a result, also maximum muscle power is increased. And as I told you, maximum unloaded movement speed is was very also very much improved in, in response to regimes of, of heavy muscle loading and strength training. So what I like to focus on in my talk here will be exclusively explosive strength, or as we like to call it, the rate of force development sometime also being denoted as the rapid uh, force capacity, um, which basically this is a very simple, almost cartoon uh, graph showing that when we have a subject and uh, this po person is performing an isometric or static maximum quadriceps contraction, so the knee extensors are contracting. The joint angle is not changing because this is uh, opposed by um, a cable We're measuring the force of extension down here. And we have carefully instructed this person to make the force increase as fast as possible during the tests. And of course, we will be recording the maximum force as a measure of maximum strength, but also the slope of this force time curve will be recorded and that is termed the rate of force development. We would do that slope calculation in very short periods of time, 50, 100, 200 milliseconds of, uh, of contraction following onset of force. And the reason why we're doing that is because in many, many types of athletic events, we have very short time available for producing force. 0 0.08 up to 0 0.12 uh, second uh, is the time contact during sprint running also for soccer players or team handball players sprinting down the pitch. Um, whereas it takes much longer time to reach maximum isometric or dynamic force in human skeletal muscle, almost 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 and even half a second. You see in this person, 0 0.8 second to reach maximum force and in many, many sporting events, this is far too slow to be useful for any practical purpose. Really, what is more important is the ability to have a very steep rise in force in the very early phase of rising or increasing muscle force. And that will mean an increased rate of force development. Um, 
in athletes, even homogeneous groups of um, explosive type athletes, in this case, at least rugby players from the UK. This is a study by Jonathan Follen and, and Neil Tillin and, and co-workers. You see a quite nice correlation between this the acceleration ability um, and the rate of force development measured in this static uh, squat extension um, using a Smith machine with a locked bar and then a force plate under the feet and being instructed to make force increase as fast as possible. Then the normalized rate of force development normalized to maximum force uh, in the first 100 millisecond is, is very quite strongly correlated to a short, you see a high rate of force is correlated to a short uh, period of doing the zero to five meters uh, sprint, which is basically an acceleration test here. And acceleration is very important, maybe the most important feature of, of many, many athletes and many, many types of, of, of sports. So even in a homogeneous group of, of, uh, of, of team athletes uh, who all are quite, quite well off in terms of rate of force development and acceleration capacity, even there, we can see a, a strong correlation between you know, the, the athletes with the highest uh, normalized rate of force are also those with the best or most superior acceleration capacity here. We have seen pretty much similar results going more, uh, more isolated to the quadriceps muscle and the hamstring muscles, seeing these correlations. And these are in, in some of the best team handball players in Denmark, um, some of the best professional teams that we have. Uh, these measurements have been performed. So measuring isometric rate of force development for the quadriceps, um, and then correlating this to zero to, to five meter acceleration time or 10 meter acceleration time. We see these uh, quite nice correlations and strong correlations between uh, a high rate of force development and a superior sprint ability. So you can see that the, that the athletes with a very short acceleration or sprint times, also those athletes who are very high in the rate of force development on their quadriceps. Surprisingly to some, uh, we see similar correlations on the hamstring muscles. So the explosive strength of the hamstrings also strongly correlated uh, to sprint ability here, zero to 10 meters sprint time, so a short time correlated to a high explosive strength in the rate of, or rate of force development on the hamstrings, simply because of course, that the hip extension uh, and therefore not only glutei muscle, but also hamstring muscles are, are, is a very important feature during uh, the acceleration phase of sprinting. So, all in all, um, the rate of force development and having a high explosive strength capacity is extremely important for many types of athletic movement and, and especially for the term or the ability to, to accelerate. So rate of force development depends on a, on a number of factors which we have time to discuss if and when you will visit us in UCAM at some point in time, which I hope of course you will. Uh, an arch muscle is a strong muscle and it turns out also a muscle with high rate of force development. So one strategy, actually the place to start, in fact, I think would to increase rate of force would be to increase skeletal muscle size. So inducing hypertrophy of, of the muscle. But another very important feature, which I like to discuss and, and mention for you is also the magnitude of neuromuscular activation. So basically the neural drive to the muscle fibers from the brain and spinal cord, especially the firing frequency, so the number of nerve impulses from the spinal motor neurons running out to the active muscle fibers. is very strong determinant of the rate of force. So you know that we have the spinal cord, we have the spinal motor neurons receiving input from the brain, being activated, sending out nerve impulses to the muscle fibers, which become activated and create a high force power and rate of force. We can put on electrodes and measure the, the, the nerve impulse signals, which sums up into this uh, surface EMG signal here. And, and newer mythologies here have indicated how important this EMG drive is for the rate of force development. This is kind of a multi-array electrodes that can be put on muscles here. And from the different electrode configurations, you can see different EMG signals being picked up. This is during an isometric ramp. Um, doing these isometric ramps with a very high intentional rate of force development, you see the different uh, uh, Motor units can actually be identified here by this surface EMG de decomposition techniques, which are quite new being developed uh, in the recent years. And what you see here is the firing frequency of single 
uh, spinal motor neurons during the onset of force, so during the phase of rising muscle force, during the rate of force development phase. And you can see very, very high firing frequencies of the, of the different spinal motor neurons at the onset of force. And this is very strong determinant of the slope of this curve, in other words, of the rate of force development. And here you see the evidence for that. On the x-axis, you have the rate of force development being developed and the different colors, the different persons. And what you have on the y-axis is the discharge rate of, of, of different spinal motor neurons being extracted from this surface EMG signal by, by sophisticated mathematical methods. And see quite nice and strong correlation between the discharge rate of spinal motor neurons and the maximum rate of force development that the muscle can produce. So in other words, if we like to increase rate of force, one uh, very feasible and effective strategy would be to learn the spinal motor neurons to increase at a very high firing frequency. And exactly this is what happens with the strength training. Uh, just a few examples here, what we see, and, and this is how we are measuring uh, isometric rate of force development on the quadriceps. So we have a static contraction. We are blocking the arm on the dynamometer here at 70 degree knee joint angle where the person is strongest. He's instructed to make the force increase as fast and steeply as possible. And we will be measuring the slope in the very initial time intervals, 30, 50 milliseconds, but also in the later time intervals, 100 and 200 milliseconds. In the very early time intervals, this is very important for the first steps of acceleration. Um, if you're a sprinter getting out of the starting block and, and the later phases here are, are determined also not only by neural drive to muscle fibers, but also in, by the size of the muscle as such. Um, and what we can see is that, that three and a half, four months of heavy resistance strength training results in a, in a huge and significant increase in the slope of this force time curve uh, of the quadriceps. So in other words, the rate of force development is markedly increased both in the very early time interval, as you see here, but also in the late phase uh, intervals of 100 and 200 milliseconds following onset of contraction. As I mentioned, uh, the increase in neuromuscular activation might be a very strong candidate for this increase in explosive strength. And the way we are measuring this is more simple. And I just uh, show you in the advanced multi-array recordings before. We have just simple uh, bipolar recording from the different muscles of the quadriceps. And you see the EMG signals, basically the sum of nerve impulses and the frequency of firing. And we can do a filtering on these EMG and what we are seeing, quantifying the amplitude of, of these uh, filtered EMG and relying this to the change in the rate of force development with training. What we can see here is that the EMG activity is very much increased. I'm sorry for this kind of busy, graph here, but you see the VL marked in red. So the MG activity in the, in, in the first 30 milliseconds of muscle activation and following three months of strength training is almost doubled. In fact, it is doubled. So we have we have 100% increase in the magnitude of neuromuscular activation on the muscle fibers following this period of training. In, in 50 milliseconds, you see 120% increase, so huge increase too. And if we calculate the neural drive from zero to 100 milliseconds on the longer interval, you also see about 80% increase in the magnitude of neuromuscular activation. So a huge increase in the neural drive to the muscle fiber as, as a result of the heavy resistance strength training performed. We could even quantify this uh, even more clearly by calculating the kind of a rate of force analysis, rate of force development analysis only on the EMG signal. So calculating the rate of EMG rise, or yeah, rate of EMG rise, I guess, this is what we call it. And you can see the hatch bars, are the rate of EMG rise following the period of strength training, is huge and significant increases, especially in the very, very short time intervals here for all the muscles exam. So a basic feature in response to heavy resistance strength training is that we have this marked increase in neuromuscular activation uh, following training, um, been demonstrated for many types of muscle, not only quadriceps, also the plantar flexors and other muscles. And this is uh, largely, largely responsible for the con concurrent increase in explosive strength, the increase in rate of force development, which is very important uh, for the athletes to, to perform these stretch shortening cycle actions like side cutting very fastly, uh, and also to be able to accelerate um, 
at a tremendous speed or at a very short time because of reaching very high levels of force in, in much shorter time following in the period of strength training. So just before I end, i like to bring in also just um, a small example on how muscle morphology also contributes to the change and increase in rate of force with training. And as you know, we have different measures. We can do the MRI scans and doing it in elderly, maybe we are doing CT scans to allow muscle uh, into the measurement too. And could even use ultrasound to, to quantify changes in, in muscle architecture. So in, 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 in pination angle of single muscle fibers or bundles of, bundles of fibers. But as you will see in just a second, we also take out muscle biopsies and look at the area or the size of the single fibers and here we are able to quantify the effect of strength training uh, on, on the magnitude of, of muscle growth, muscle hypertrophy um, with training. And just to summarize, and, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that whatever level of evidence we, we try to look at, we can see clearly uh, clear, clear proof of increases in muscle size with the resistant training, both when we do the MRIs or the CT scannings, when we do the single muscle fibers, a number of studies demonstrating uh, marked increases in fiber area. And also uh, we can see changes in mu muscle architecture. So basically muscle fibers are, are standing at a more steep uh, angle, uh, allowing muscle fibers to become extremely strong for a given uh, volume of, of muscle um, after a period of strength training here. The way we are, to, uh, are taking out the muscle biopsy is, is in this case from the quadriceps and, and typically the, the, the lateral vasti muscle on the on side of it. And, and we can take the muscle biopsy out. In fact, we are not doing, well, it's a medical doctor who of course is doing this type of action here. And she, this is Charlotte Sueta. She's very trained in this. And uh, afterwards it comes out, we can do the histochemical stainings and quantify the different fiber types and calculate the area of the muscle fibers and see how the different fiber types are changing. We're do, doing different types of uh, immunohistochemical stainings to quantify the different fiber types. Here you have slow twitch one and a fast twitch 2A and 2X fibers um, being identified and we can quantify and measure the, the cross-sectional area of the fibers following training. And what we often see with strength training is that the Type two fibers, these are different persons. And these are the group mean values before and after three and a half months heavy resistance structure. And you see a huge 20, almost 20% 20 increase in type two fiber area. And these are the most explosive and powerful muscle fibers that we have. Whereas uh, the more fatigue resistance, oxidative type one fibers are not really increasing much in size. For a few persons, they are, but, but for other persons, uh, the increase is very small or even negative, you see. So this is a typical finding that we have this more marked or maybe more preferential increase in type two fiber area in response to strength training compared to that seen in type one fiber area. So a number of studies have shown and, and demonstrated this you know, preferential um, um, willingness to grow to grow in the response to centering of, of these uh, type 2 fibers. Uh, but there are also a number of studies, I'd say maybe 20% of all the published data out there right now, um, is showing that we have somewhat comparable increases in both type 1 and type 2 fiber areas, which is uh, very interesting to many types of athletes, actually, especially in those who likes to have as much uh, muscle size as, as, as ever possible in their sports. You can see also with the, with high doses of protein supplementation, we see also a signs of um, maybe more marked type one fiber hypertrophy in response to training. And this is an important feature, uh, especially to have the type two fibers increasing in area, maybe selectively or more marked than type one uh, fibers is, because that will shift the overall type type two fiber area to a greater to a greater fraction. And we know that there is a strong correlation between the rate of force development, even in the very initial phase, and then the type two fiber area percentage. And this is measured in, in different studies, um, maybe not so much in human studies. This is one of the few human data sets that exists um, in, in, in young physical uh, education students, not, not engaged in systematic strength training. So increasing the type two fiber area percentage as a result of training Strength training is one feasible and effective strategy to also improve 
greater force development uh, in a human skeletal muscle following strength training. So just to summarize, I hope that, uh, and I'm sorry for this speeding presentation here, but I hope that I convinced you that we can see signs of clear uh, increases in neuromuscular activation in response to strength training. And this is a very strong contributor to the increase in explosive strength following uh, this type of training. It's mainly relying on increased discharge rates of spinal motor neurons. At the same time, with the same type of training, we can actually make muscle fibers grow. And, and this will also increase not only maximum strength capacity, but also the rate of force development, especially in those conditions where we have a marked or more preferential uh, increase of type two muscle fiber areas compared to that of, of type one areas. So a lot of changes are going on and uh, hopefully, we will meet in the Murcia at some point in the future to discuss this more closely and have a little more time than just 21 minutes. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward for uh, to a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ogor. You're welcome. If you can, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen yep. for a yep. moment. Thank there you. you. So if you have any questions again for Dr. Ogor, uh, please uh, write them in the preguntas y respuestas or questions and answers icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, next, I would like to present our my colleague, Jose Carlos from the UCOM Spanish Sports University, who will give you um, a brief summary of what the Spanish Sports University is about and highlighting our master's program. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, uh, our guest speakers today for sharing their knowledge and experiences with us. It's an honor and a privilege to hear from them. Um, well, I'm here just to explain a little bit about what UCAM Spanish Sports University offers, okay? We are a postgraduate school uh, where our future students can uh, course different programs related with uh, different areas of sport, like sport management, marketing and communication, health and physical activity, and sport uh, performance. We have a lot of programs related uh, all these areas and others in Spanish. And we have a very uh, very, very, very good experience developing these kind of programs. And because of this, we have uh, uh, an agreement with Barça Innovation Hub um, to so every student be a uh, course uh, organized by Barça Innovation Hub. Okay, and also we want our future student to have uh, what we call the UCAM experience, in where our students are going to be involved in a very uh, international environment with a lot of students from many countries. And we, now, we try and we want our students to have uh, the, the, the starting steps to their professional path, to their professional career. And that's why we offer this kind of programs with an academic guarantee. And in, in this international environment, uh, the networking that our students are going to have is very, uh, is very high and they are going to, to meet so many people from so many countries and in the future this, this is going to be very positive for their professional career and also in their academic career if they want to go further uh, in PhD programs or something similar, okay? And for all of these, we have a very high class and top level uh, professors. In the, we are going to see some info about uh, the masters that we offer in terms of um, strength and conditioning. But also I would like to highlight first uh, the agreements that we have with uh, entities and clubs or uh, companies related with the sports. All of our students are going to do uh, 
uh, internships during their um, course. And that's why we have these agreements with these companies. And we are open every year to, to get new agreements with new companies that are, are being created every day. Um, so our students are going to have a very professional um, experience. And finally, I would like to talk a little about our master's degree in high performance, strength and conditioning. We have two versions, the English version and the Spanish version. Oh, both of them are in B learning, okay? And they are one year a course with 60 ECTS. Uh, the Spanish version is starting in November 2021, and the English version will start in January 2022. Uh, both of them are developed in Murcia campus, and they give you access to do a PhD program after, okay? Um, obviously, our best uh, page to show to the future students is the teaching faculty. We have a lot of professors from many countries, uh, all of them, as I said before, top level and high class in their uh, areas. And as you can see in this image, we try to bring professors from all over the world to, um, to teach uh, the, the students uh, in the areas that are course in the, during the master, okay? Um, last, one last thing, I would like you to invite to the rest of the sessions we have this week. Uh, tomorrow we will talk about the sport management. On Wednesday we will talk about the sport tourism management. And on Thursday we will talk about the digital innovation in a sports. If you want more info, you can follow us in our Twitter account or just go to our um, web page and where you can uh, see all the information related with all, uh, all of our programs and the Spanish Sport University Week 2021. Thank you very much. I hope you have had time enough to uh, think your, your questions to our uh, speakers. So, Linda. You Thank you, Jose just... Carlos. Thank you. So I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, I hope that what Tori, Dr. Ogord has conveyed in their talks is that uh, to have sex success in the area of, of high performance sport, it's highly dependent on the ability to translate the foundations of scientific research uh, in sports sciences um, to the to the field, no, to the athlete, athlete training programs, both in individual and team sports. So our objective really in our master's program is to enhance uh, the knowledge and experience of the student in the specific field of strength and conditioning. As you can see, as uh, Jose Carlos has highlighted, we have highly respected professors. Uh, they are experts at both scientific uh, level as well as at the professional level in their respective fields. And they've been invited and have formed part of our teaching faculty uh, in the different disciplines of strength and conditioning. Um, uh, one also aspect, in, in addition to the Barca Hub Innovation uh, Seminar that students are able to to um, register for. Our master's program is also accredited by the NSCA Strength and Conditioning Association, um, accredited through the, sorry, the Education Recognition Program. So our students also have the bonus of being able to certify it as a, a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning specialist that comes part with the tuition fee. Um, so uh, I, I, I truly believe that students acquire a powerful interdisciplinary approach. Um, uh, and a skill set uh, that will enable them to succeed in, in their professional career. And I hope that Tor is a great example of that. Um, so we will begin now the question and answer session. I believe we have a few. Um, for Dr. Ogord, what is the difference between rate of force development and uh, RFC? I'm not sure exactly. Uh, what RFC is? Me neither. No. <laughs> no. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, I think I'm sorry if I destroy your name, Abdul Jabbar. Can you um, clarify what you mean by RFC? 
reactive force capacity? Maybe, I'm not sure. Well, while we're waiting for um, his feedback, um, there's another question by Ben Dolstar. Uh, he says, thank you. What exercise would you recommend doing to, I, I suppose, to help increase rate of force development? <laughs> there are, you know, where you want to start. I mean, there are so many exercises you could do. And I guess if you've never done strength training before, maybe you should start in a leg press and an isolated knee extension for a few weeks. Um, and there are other types of nice machines that would do a simple and safe workout for you, which will make actually muscles grow and also stimulate neuromuscular activation. And then eventually you will go into training with free weights and use uh, exercises like the squat, of course, which is the main, maybe the main exercise in, in different variants. And you can do, of course, um, deadlifts will be very important if you talk about improving sprint ability also. Um, there are so many different exercises that can be done um, using free weights and of course going into the to the to some of the lifts that weightlifters are doing and powerlifters are doing also and even Olympic weightlifting can can be quite stimulatory uh, too to some athletes. Great, um, Abdul Jabbar has clarified and yes, he was talking about reactive force capacity. So, what is the difference between rate of force development and reactive force capacity? No, I'm not 100 percent sure on reactive force capacity, but is that if you're doing repetitive jumping? Is that the flight time divided by the contact time? Um, I'd like to know that because then I could give a detailed answer. Let's see what he says here. Yeah, sometimes this is, you know. Yeah, so while yeah. we wait for Abdul Jabbar's um, answer to that, we yeah. can keep going. Um, so does these adaptations in muscles differ a lot in elderly population with, um, I suppose, the neuromuscular adaptations that occur in, in athletes? Would, they, would you see this, these same adaptations in the elderly population? Yeah, it, it, exactly. And that, that's why you talked about, Linda, in your, in, in your sort of introduction to this questioning that, that that so much um, knowledge from science could be transferred and translated into to, um, to practice on the field and in the weight room, but actually it goes the other way around, even more so I think we get inspired by the, by the experience and, and the regimes that Tor and, and, and guys like him are doing in the gym because we can use it quite effectively to increase muscle mass and improve neuromuscular function in old individuals, even frail uh, patients. And you would be amazed on how much they can tolerate these patients as long as we are very careful in the progression and make sure not to, to go to proceed too fast and too rapidly. So to avoid injury, basically. But yeah, to, in, in most parameters, they have, old people have the same magnitude of plasticity and the range of adaptation that, that we see in, in young individuals. Yeah. There are a few points where they don't really able to adapt in, in, in a certain period of time, only meaning that they need maybe twice as long time to, to reach those goals that, that we can achieve in a shorter time in young individuals. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, next question goes to Jose Carlos. What does B learning mean? Hi, well, it's uh, in these courses are done on campus. I mean, you are going to have lessons uh, physically uh, in the classrooms, but you will also to have you will have also to do different assignments and different projects uh, by your own. So that's why we combine this uh, on-campus activity with uh, virtual or uh, personal activity at home. Thank you, Jose Carlos. Um, next question is from Kelvin. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I think this uh, question is oriented to both Dr. Ogord as well as Tor. What would you provide as training recommendations to athletes, assuming team sport athletes where power or rate of force development is of importance, especially in times like these with lockdowns and gym closures with little to minimal equipment? Tor, would you like to start? 
Uh, for example, we had a lot of lot of Zoom training sessions in our in our lockdowns. Um, for for me, especially with with my handball players and and athletes and in football, uh, we used a lot of well activation mobility work. And for the strength and power exercises, we I used a lot of isometric work where they sat in a split squat or Bulgarian squat for a few seconds. Then I did some squats. And then again, I did some hops straight afterwards. So basically just a French contract training with body weight. Uh, with minimal equipment, you, you can do this all at home. Uh, and so, so we use that a lot. That's a good Paolo, idea. Would you like to add? Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a brilliant approach because uh, it's so overseen that using isometric muscle now, static muscle actions to stimulate for for at least keeping up strength and also keeping up muscle mass and avoiding atrophy uh, in in those in those you know in these times where we are not able to go to the gym and use the free weights or the machines. So it's a brilliant idea, and you can you can create quite heavy loadings and quite severe muscle or effective muscle stimulation during these static uh, regimes. And I think also they are interesting because you might get some kind of blood flow occlusion effect in there by the isometric muscle actions because basically because of the high muscle forces, we get this um, transient ischemia because of the restriction of blood flow due to the high muscle pressure. So we get some, some interesting stimulation there, I think on, on skeletal muscle mass. Great. Um, this uh, next question is oriented to Dr. Agard. Um, thank you for your presentation. I had a question regarding the start and acceleration phase in team sports athletes like soccer, futsal, handball, or rugby. Would it be prudent to assume that in this phase, that is start and acceleration, the hip flexors like the quadriceps and the psoas play a greater role, perhaps due to an increased ground contact time? Since the sprinting distances aren't usually that long, if we compare them with 100 meter sprint athletes, how much of a role would hip extensors sorry, play, like the gluteal muscle group and the hamstrings? Well, to answer the, the first, the last thing first, I say, I, I, I'm kind of, I, I'm kind of guess that you can't really overestimate the role of the gluteus and the hamstrings for the sprinting ability and not definitely not in the acceleration phase and not even in the high speed phase of reaching the maximum uh, uh, speed. I think that this, these will be the most dominant muscles and also the, the most, I mean, you would really need to, to try to target these muscles uh, to improve your sprint capacity. And then for the hip flexors, of course, to have a high rate, uh, a high um, cadency, high frequency of stride, you need to have also very strong hip flexors. But in terms of propulsion per se, I don't think they are highly decisive on that. But of course they play a role because you know maximum speed is the product of, of step length and then frequency of, of uh, trotting or, or stand. So, so, and there you need to, to have a high frequency, you need very strong hip flexors, that's for sure. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Alejandro. Oh, to Dr. Ogor, some studies agree that the percentage of type 2X fibers, perhaps uh, the hybrid fibers 2A, 2X, seems to decrease with training, even if this training is conducted with a low degree of fatigue and increases with the cessation of training or during detraining. Why do you think this may occur? I think it occurs because it's a default setting. If we take out a genetically default setting inside the DNA of the muscle fibers, if we take out muscle fibers from person's spinal cord injured individuals sitting in a wheelchair for years, or maybe a high number, long number of years, we can see that they may have 80%, uh, 85% type 2X fibers. Whereas, you know, normal young subjects and old subjects, they have maybe 10%, maximum 15% 2X fibers. So I guess it could be like a default setting. And once we start to be a physically active, there will be some kind of stimulation on the genes coding for myosin heavy chain 2A and type 1. But if we have total um, disuse and inactivity and, and, and not much of neural innovation on fibers, maybe we will see this, this massive shift towards uh, 2X, which at least would allow to jump into a tree if, you know, lying on the savanna and the lion would 
be passing by back in evolution time. So it, it might save your life in that split second. Of course, you wouldn't be able to crawl very long, uh, but you need to be you know, better conditioned to do that. So maybe that could be some kind of selection, primary selection outcome training. But it's true that, you know, strength training re really down, down regulates 2x and a lot of people see that as a problem, but you know, what happens is that 2x fibers are transformed into 2a fibers, which are highly fatigue resistant. So they are a little less explosive and a little a lower rate of force development compared to 2x fibers, but they can be activated again and again and again during a match. So ideally, actually, for a soccer player or a rugby player or a bicyclist or, you know, road racer or um, mountain bike athlete and so on, every athlete who needs to do a high number of acceleration and high speeds, high power movements will need the fatigue type two fiber better than the two X fiber, my guess. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question by Abdul Jabbar. Uh, I believe this will is directed to Jose Carlos more. In regards to the internship, is it guaranteed that we will be interning with the club? Do you wanna start answering this question first and then I can follow up. Yeah, well, what we do in, in this in this master program, we have a subject uh, in where you have to do an internship period, okay? And this is mandatory for completing the, the course, okay? So what we do at the beginning of the course normally is to uh, have an interview with our students and, and that allow us to know exactly what is the profile of our student. So we can, um, we can provide an internship for the student in a club or in a gym or a sports center or a research center. So what the, the university have different uh, agreements with different entities and depending on the uh, interest of the student and their profile, we try to, to bring the student in a, very, uh, in a good position for their uh, future professional career or academic uh, career. And I don't know, uh, Linda, if you want to add anything No, I, I think, I think Jose Carlos uh, summed it up pretty well. We do have a practical module where students do have to complete 108 hours of uh, internship in either a club or gym, um, research center, sports center, et cetera. Um, and yes, uh, there is a class dedicated to this to explain more in detail how to apply, how to um, uh, give an uh, idea of your interests, of what you wish to gain from your internship. Um, in many cases, a lot of students like to return home because uh, when they do their internship, um, so we can find uh, and create educational agreements in their own countries. Um, it does need a little bit of help from, from the student to, to locate one, but it is possible to create new, new agreements so that the internship can happen and while the student is at home. Um, but also in Murcia and all over Spain, we have educational agreements for clubs. In most cases, um, is it, without the pandemic uh, situation, it is possible to work with first division athletes. However, um, not always. It depends on the season, the competitive season, how they're doing. It also depends on the um, the willingness to accept students in, in that year. Um, but most likely you can enter e either in their more um, second division, third division teams or including the, 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 the junior teams. Yeah, because that's where you'll learn more. You get more hands-on experience with the lower levels than you do at the professional. In most cases, from what I understand, the professional is those, those students who were able to get uh, into the first division team only were able to observe. They weren't able to do hands-on, but they were able to learn through observation, obviously, but it's not practical in that sense. So uh, don't be discouraged if, if uh, you do enter into a club that, that uh, will allow you to, to do your internship hours at a more lower level, but he, there you have more hands-on experience. Okay, uh, let's see. 
Yes, we do also have an exercise. There's a question about if we have an exercise physiology related course in courses in income in our master's program, we do have an exercise physiology module. And does the program provide job placements um, after the master's program? Um, Jose Carlos, do you are you aware of uh, job placements after the master's program? Does the university provide this kind of service? Uh, we don't have it uh, directly. I mean, what we used to do is to offer this opportunity to the students through the internship period. So we have had some students that after completing their master course and after doing the internships, they have been hired by the clubs or, uh, or the entity or the uh, sports center. Uh, and I think, well, I think 90% of our students are employed uh, after doing the master, okay? Uh, what I want to tell you is that this master program is very useful for your professional career. Uh, obviously, you're not going to start with the first job in the in Real Madrid, for example, or or in a uh, as a trainer or a coach in a of us of an international athlete. Okay, uh, but all of them, uh, as I said, 90% of our alumni are now working as uh, strength and conditioning coaches or personal trainers, or developing even their their academic career through a PhD program. So we are very happy with our percentage of, of students that are uh, doing their professional career because of course in this master program, okay? I think Tor is a great example of this. Um, right after his master's uh, program, he sent out his CV to various uh, clubs and centers, and he had the great fortune of being taken in for a small part and then gradually assuming more responsibilities. No, Tor? Yes, I did. So it's a, it, it, it worked out great for me with that. Great. Um, we have one minute uh, of the session left. We have one last question here. Do you provide scholarships for international students? Um, I believe there is a work study scholarship, yes, uh, Jose Carlos, that students can apply. Yes, every, every year we provide different scholarships for each program. So we have one for the masters, for this master, we have a scholarship a scholarship where you will have a discount on the fee and you will be under the sport structure of the university. We have a professional football club, professional basketball club with all of the youth teams, etc. and a lot of different athletes in other sports. Uh, so, we offer one of them and also the university and the international uh, department of the university. They also offer different uh, scholarships. So if you are interested in this, I invite you to look for the information in our website because we have everything uh, at your disposal, okay? Great, thank you, Jose Carlos. Well, um, as I will try to keep my promise, <laughs> we will end today's e-session. Thank you, Tor. Thank you, Dr. Ogord and Jose Carlos for uh, attending and speaking in this webinar. Um, I'm sure that the audience has gained some new insights in what uh, the, the master's program is all about, what you can get um, from the master's program at the professional level. And um, I also wanna thank the audience for attending this webinar. I know that um, it's late in the afternoon and we have things to do, but we really appreciate it. I want to wish everyone all the best during this pandemic time. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day. We'll close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Linda. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Carlos.